others. What what do you think that people mean when they say I like Jesus but I don't like church? Um, I I think that most they see it as a building, not as individuals. Like because we are the church, not it's not a building, and I think that's what they see it. Like we don't want organized religion because it doesn't mean anything to me, but that's i feel like that's what they see it as okay you know, somebody uh mentioned early about uh they've perhaps have been carol mentioned i believe that uh, people have been hurt i think also that people have seen hypocrisy uh among christians they have seen self-righteousness among christians and therefore they don't like church for that reason and, and let's be honest about this, all right? Some of the criticism that people have, some of the criticisms that people uh, have and, and are legitimate. There are things that people who call themselves Christians need to repent of and confess and put in the background. Now, granted, some of it is excuses, but I think if Jesus were alive today, many of the people who say that they like him would not like him because Jesus messes with your life. And when Jesus messes with your life quite unapologetically, he lets us choose and he loves us so much that he is going to speak truth to us. But I think that a lot of people who say they like Jesus probably wouldn't like Jesus because of the convicting nature of the truth that he speaks. So I, I think there's a poor understanding is really what I'm saying uh, when people say, I, I like Jesus, but I don't like church. They don't understand the connection many times. Other thoughts? Dale? Yeah, Peter. Well, uh, <clears throat> certainly the most consistent metaphor in the New Testament for the church is a body, which is an organism and not an organization. Now, the Jews had already turned their worship in a synagogue. Okay, it was a, a club. Okay, it, was a, it, was a, it was a substitute for, for the temple in many ways. But for us, I mean, the, the most dominant metaphor is that we're an organism and that's a much bigger commitment than joining an organization. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I think about, uh, one of the, one of the prevalent men's clubs that meets at lunch all over the world demands that you show up. And if you miss on a Tuesday, you got to make it up before the next meeting because coming to that meeting is, is a critical part of being a member of that organization. Whereas for us, in other words, our, our dedication is supposed to be to one another as fingers and thumbs and arms and legs and, and, and all those things. And you can't just take or leave that. That's uh, the organism metaphor says, I'm supposed to want to be a part of it. And, uh, and it's supposed to change everything about the way I live it and I react to other members of the faith. So a proper understanding based on what Peter is saying is you can't separate Jesus from church. If you want Jesus, you got to have church too. That's right. That's part of being his body. Again, to finish out that body metaphor, who's the head? Jesus. Jesus is the head. And so you've got him as the head, and the rest of us are the hands and toes and, and uh, arms of, of, and eyes and ears of Jesus. But he is the head. And so you can't have one without the other. Uh, you can't have Jesus without church. That's a proper understanding. So turn to, turn to Matthew chapter 16. And if somebody would read Matthew 16, uh, 15 through 18, this is Jesus kind of introducing this concept of church to the disciples. 
And what I want you to again be thinking about is what does this mean for me as a member, as a part of the body of Christ? What does it mean to be church? How do people know God, see God, find God through me? All right. Somebody read uh, Matthew 16, 15 through 18. Dale, let me read. Yeah. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Okay. The English word church is translated from a Greek word, ekklesia, that means the assembly of the called out. In other words, we are to be distinct, separated from the world. All right, we're going to come back to that. I think it's uh, kind of, I think church has kind of made itself odd in some ways that, and I'm speaking very broadly here, in some of our efforts to be distinct, to be different. Uh, I think at times church has become weird uh, rather than truly uh, distinct in a godly sense. What do we learn from this exchange between Jesus and Peter about the nature of church? What do you learn about the nature of church from this exchange? What did Jesus say? One of the things he mentions is that it's from God. Okay. Church is not a man-made organization. It's not even a man-made organism. It is a God-ordained and God-empowered organism. What else? What's the foundation for the church? It's basically people listening uh, to God and God speaking to them about uh, what it is that his will is. And then they confess that just like Peter did. All right. And you're using confession in the sense of proclaiming, in the sense of declaring uh, yes. Yes. Others, what do you see there? Jesus is our foundation. He's where it's built on. So he's got to be the, the bottom. All right. Somebody's saying something, but I can't identify where it's coming from. It's from me, Linda. And I'm just saying that Jesus is the foundation. So therefore, we have to build on him. So he's the, All right. he's the bottom. We have to build on Jesus in particular. Jesus will say in the sermon, or did say in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew um, chapter 7, uh, that a wise man builds his house on the rock, and he said the rock are the teachings, are his teachings, teachings of Jesus. The, the foundation of our faith is that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God. Church belongs to Christ. What does Paul say in the letter to the Second Corinthians? He says, or First Corinthians, he says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So when we think about um, the role that we play as church, we have to understand we're not in a position in any way to say, well, this is what I want to do, or this is what, what I prefer. We don't belong to ourselves. We're, we're not in a position to make those kinds of statements. We are under the lordship 
of the one who has bought us at the price of his death, burial, and resurrection. So that's where we need to remember that we are and that there's no power that can stop the kingdom of God. A person, uh, the only choice a person has is to reject it. We're, the kingdom of God is not going to be stopped, but they can, but people can reject uh, the kingdom of God. Jesus says, not even the gates of Hades, not even the gates of hell, some translations say, can, uh, can stop. All right? So this is what we're a part of. This is, this is, this is who we are. Unfortunately, this is question number three. Unfortunately, church has been distinctive in notorious ways. Unbelievers often equate church with hypocrisy, judgmentalism, irrelevance, and joylessness. Our divisiveness has been embarrassing. Our history of racism is abhorrent. And our compartmental compartmentalized lives where we live one day on sun one way on Sunday and a very different way the rest of the time has given people good reason to question our authenticity. There are things that we must be honest and confessional about and repent of. Now I'm speaking in very general terms and I am speaking from the vantage point of an unbeliever, what they often see. Um so what is the world supposed to see from church so that they might see God? They are our commitment level, for one. Our commitment to God. Uh, if I am committed to God, and the reason I'm committed to God is because I understand about his grace and mercy, that he sent his son to die for me, and I respond in an appropriate way by doing what he says, that is, uh, obedience. And my obedience, because of my focus in him and his ways, will also point other people to God in a similar way. Tom, can you come up with an example? What, is, what does that look like in a believer's life that somebody... It, coming from the world might see and say, you know, that person is distinct because what do they see? What's that? I think, that I think there are lots of factors involved. They see, uh, for example, in my life, I try to point people to God by the way I act, uh, by the way I behave around them. The words that I speak, I mention God in my conversations. Okay. A God focused conversation might exactly. be distinctive. Okay. Yes. And doing godly things. I mean, you you reach out to people and you help them as you are able. In addition to that, what they should be seeing is our love for each other, as well as as for our fellow man, but especially our love for each other in the church. Peggy, because what does that look like that's distinct. I mean, there are a lot of people in the world who who love in a certain way. What is it about our love that's distinctive? Well, yeah, it's that, that agape love. Self-serving, uh, self-sacrificing uh, concern for another's well-being yeah. above and beyond our own needs. All right, so a self-sacrificing, sacrificial, submissive type of, of love. I want to add to that since we're talking about love. One of the things that should make us distinctive that does not make us very distinctive if you trust the statistics is a reconciling love. One of the things that enables, one of the things that looks distinctive in our world today is a love that's able to overcome conflict. Conflict's going to happen in, in human relationship. That's a given. But what happens from that? Do we just go separate ways? 
Or is there something about being in Christ that allows us to be able to reconcile in the way that the world is unable to do? You know what I'm talking about here? That's distinctive. Dale. Yeah. Uh, there's an old, an old saying that blood is thicker than water. And it means that, that usually your family will tolerate things in you, forgive things in you, uh, sacrifice things for you that they won't do for just anybody. Mm. Well, that's supposed to be a distinguishing mark of the body of Christ is that, that, that for us, the blood of Christ is thicker than water. And, and so they should see that our children should see that in our congregational life. And, uh, and that's a distinctive thing. It, it's a validating thing. Yeah. If, if, if people, if people see the same thing in our lives, in the way that we interact with one another, in the way that we love one another, if they see the same thing from us that they see in their own lives, what would, what would attract them to that? How would that be? How would they find God in that? Um, this, is, this is convicting. I, I think also one of the things that people will see that's distinctive in a world that's full of pride is that they'll see humility. Uh, this is not a humble world. Uh, people are oftentimes tooting their own horns and looking out for themselves. It, it's not humility that drives this world. What else do you? What else is distinctive about church? Yeah, one of the, one of the things that um, I was thinking about is in in the light of the love is um, Cora, our granddaughter. Uh, when you tell her that you love her, she comes back and says, I love. And I, I, the other day I was just thinking about that and it says, that's a, that's a love that doesn't really have a specific object. It's a state of being. And I think that's what we see in God when God is saying, it says, God is love. He loves. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's beyond just a single object. It's a love that's, unconditional a love that is permeates our life and um you know hearing cora say it it's just it's, it's kind of it's really cute but you know you think about it in terms of what that really means is i love mm. i love you i love you know the church i love what the church does in my life and I think that's a, a, a part of what this, the distinctive nature of the love that the church is, should have is that distinctive nature of God's love. So, so everything I do, my motivation is love, even when it has to be tough love. Yeah. Brenda, you were about to say something, I think. Um, I was just going to say that um, the, the world watches us and one of the, we can talk about love and everything, but when it really comes down to brass tacks, um, how does that how does that really look like? And it, it's everything from, you know, I, we've had a lot of medical stuff in our family, and when people ask me, how do you get through that? I wouldn't have gotten through it if it wasn't for Christ and my church family. I wouldn't have made it through it. When um, COVID starts and you see all these people, how can I help? How can I help? What can I do? There's more people that want to help and do than there are that people even need to receive that we know, you know? There's people in the community that need that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's actually servicing the community in a way. It's not talking um, bad about your sister or your brother to some person, you know, in the school PTA or whatever, you know? It's about being um, supportive. It's about um, then seeing you pray together with your sister, your brother. Um, it's about um, speaking love in, about your church family. Hmm. What startled so many people about the way Jesus loved was that he loved people who nobody else loved. 
right. loved people who other people kind of discarded. Now, that, that wasn't that the claim the Pharisees and scribes had against him? What are you doing? What are you doing hanging out with sinners and tax collectors? You're, you're not, if you were a righteous man, you, you wouldn't hang around people like that. Well, sometimes that's the way church acts. We don't hang around people like that. And when we behave that way, how is the world supposed to believe that there's anything unique about us? You know, if, if, if we have, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about the bus ministry, I wasn't uh, around much bus ministry, but I've heard stories even from the life of Greenlawn, when Greenlawn had a bus ministry, that a lot of the kids that came in were disruptive. They'd never been in a church building before. They were unruly and, and didn't know how to take care of things in the right way. And uh, a lot of people just wanted to get rid of them because they were, they were messing up what was comfortable. Well, loving in a unique Jesus way is loving even in that circumstance when uh, it's a little more harder to love. I think also what, um, what people are going to see is they're going to see things like ethics in business. Uh, that I, I, even when it costs me, I'm going to do the ethical right thing in my business. Uh, we support the vulnerable. We support the needy. Uh, again, what we see when we read scripture in the life of Jesus is what we want the world to see in us, what we want to see in one another, to model and encourage one another to live this way. That's when the world will begin to see God. That's when people will begin to find God, including even among us. All right. Acts chapter 4, 32 through 37. Um, I think it should say 42 through 47, if I am not mistaken. Um, let me make sure about that before somebody reads it. Yeah, it's 42 through 47. Somebody read Acts 2, 42 through 47, please. No, no, no. It's Acts 4. Maybe I'll get it right one of these days. Acts 4, 32 through 37. I actually had it right. <laughs> Somebody read that for us. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of the, his possessions were his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Okay. Thank you, Tommy. Um, here's a picture of church, all right? This is, um, this, is, this is the church functioning. What do you see in these verses in the way the church was behaving that reveals the nature of God? What do you see? Selflessness. Where do you see selflessness? Well, they were put, giving everything they had, and then it was going to whoever had need. I mean, they were denying themselves things maybe that 
that they had, or maybe they were given out of their abundance, but maybe not even out of their abundance. Okay. So they were sharing their resources so that uh, no one was needy reveals the, the, the nature of God. What else do you see? On the last question, I was going to say that we needed to get our <clears throat> heart and mind in the same direction. And it's then it says it in here, 32 here, the yeah. congregation who believed were of one heart and one mind. All right, so there's this oneness that is characteristic of the Father, Son, and the Spirit that we talked about earlier that we see in the church. Their oneness was a reflection of the character of God. What else? What they keep talking about? What church keep talking about? Verse 33. The resurrection of Jesus. Witness. They kept talking about the resurrection of Jesus. They kept witnessing to the fact that Jesus was resurrected. That this, that this Jesus that they were talking about, his character was one of power, even power over death. So again, we're... We're, we're getting a, a clear picture of Jesus through church in this way. I will mention this, uh, and then we'll move on to the next question. There was grace among them, uh, evident through uh, a lot of what Barnabas did, but um, they were truly for one another. They were truly for one another. Uh, Neil, I wanted to add, uh, say one more thing about this. You know, it, it occurs to me there's another dimension to this. I need to learn how to love someone and do something that that means something to them, not to me. Mm -hmm. In other words, we probably all know circumstances or situations where, uh, well, I did something for so-and-so and they didn't appreciate it. Well, maybe I should rethink that and do something that they would appreciate. Have that heart about me. Seek to do something or to say something to help them. I think that would be a reflection of the agape love that we've been talking about. Yeah, and even even in your illustration, Tom, uh, if if I'm if I supposedly give something to someone and I give it out of love, am, am I supposed to expect anything? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it is, if I'm expecting something, then there's an exchange taking place, and is it really love then? Right. Well, yeah. of course, really. my, my point is, uh, I know you understand it, but I, I just wanted to emphasize that. I, my attitude should be, to love that person in ways that they will understand. Right. Listening and being attentive to their heart right. so I can respond in love to what means something to their heart. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next question. Dale. Dale. I hear a voice. That's Roger. Yes, sir. What, what you got? I wanted to mention that when Christ healed the 10 lepers, only one came back and thanked him. But, and he was disappointed, I suppose, that the all 10 didn't come back, but he didn't blind the other nine. <laughs> yeah. In other words, it was a free gift. They received it, no strings attached. He appreciated, he appreciated their appreciation the one man's appreciation, but he didn't blind the other nine just because they didn't show that level of appreciation. He truly gave something. Yes, and which he could have taken back. That's right. That's right. All right. Hebrews chapter one, verse three. The son shows the glory of God. He is a perfect copy of God's nature. And he holds everything together by his powerful command. The Son made people clean from their sins. 
Then he sat down at the right side of God, the great one in heaven. Here's the ingenious way it works. God sent his son to earth. He was incarnated as a human being. So what you see in Jesus reveals the very nature and character of God. As disciples of Christ, church becomes like him, thus revealing the nature and character of God. In other words, people find God through church. What keeps this from happening as well as God planned it to? Well, uh, we're human and we mess up. <laughs> We're human and we mess up, okay? So sometimes people are turned off by our humanness, our imperfections, that we don't always live up to what um, we'd like to live up to, and so we don't reflect God's glory perfectly. Peter? Well, our, <clears throat> our identities as body, or as members of the church is, is really twofold. One, there's things that we don't do. And then there's the things that we do and should do. And of course, a big mistake has often been made that being a Christian is mostly the things I don't do. And uh, that's, you know, that robs the faith of all of its power and, and beauty. And so, uh, you know, hopefully as we get older, uh, you know, battling the things we shouldn't be doing becomes less of our identity and and the things we do that are Christ-like because, of course, that was the beauty of Jesus. He overcame the temptation to, you know, to do things wrongly. And, and so he spent all of his time doing wonderful good things for people. And, and that's, you know, that certainly is an attainable thing for us with the Holy Spirit, with the guidance and the, the uh, support of the body of Christ collectively, in other words, we spend less of our time fighting the sin in our life and we spend more of it enjoying the great fruits of the Spirit. Mm, very good. So we reflect as, the, as we allow the Holy Spirit to live through us, we have an opportunity to reflect the character and nature of God. I just, I just want us to understand that clearly, how, how this is intended to happen. As we become like Jesus, as we're transformed, Jesus was the perfect reflection of God. So people are going to see and find God through us as we are transformed into Christ's likeness. All right? Dale. Understand that. Yeah, go ahead, Vanita. Well, I agree with that, except that if we're so perfect, they can't relate to that either. In other words, when we relate, to, when we talk to people, we need to say, you know, we're not perfect. Only by God's grace and the blood of Jesus do we have that, you know. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is what you were saying about people that never associate with anybody outside the church. You know, if you don't do that, you're like a, cl a clique or a club. And uh, so we've got to show people that we're, we're like they are, except for Jesus. All right. So I say to you, Anita, but you're, but you're so perfect. You're, you, you, you don't have any of the struggles I do. You're, you're perfect. What, what do you say? Well, if you're my friend, you know I'm not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, imagine I'm not. Because I tell people that, you know, that's part of our daily conversation. If we're, if we have a relationship, you know I'm not perfect. And I think most people, if you start to parse words, would know that none of us are perfect. But in the minds of some people, 
they look at lives of Christians and they say, okay, I know you're not really perfect, but compared to me, you're perfect. What, what do you say to that? I struggle every day. And God, God's Holy Spirit helps me. Okay. I think one of the a couple of things that uh, Vanita is highlighting is number one, we continue to acknowledge uh, our humanness and our in perfect, imperfection. But let's point people to God and say, hey, listen, whatever good you see in me, whatever progress you see in me, whatever you think is perfection in me, it's because of God's work in me and dale i think we need to let people know it's not because we're perfect in any way but it's every day we try to be intentional yeah we are a follower of christ we try to be intentional yeah i want i want people to be able to say and, and jesus said that this is the way we're to live in matthew 5 16 he said live so that they will see the good things you do and praise your father in heaven Okay, we need to not be apologetic for living upright lives, good lives, lives that bless people. We don't be apologetic for that, but make sure he gets the glory. Okay, point people to him and say, He's the reason you see anything good in me. All right, next question. Read Ephesians 4, 10 through 16. So let's read those verses uh, together. Since others have been reluctant tonight, I'll jump in. He who ascended is, very, is the very one who, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. God has a clear plan for church and for how the gifts that he gave uh, would be used. What do you see in these verses about how people are to find God through church? What do you see in those verses? about how, God, how people find God through church. We don't all have to be good at the same things. There's diversity among us of gifts. What else? There's the desire to be mature. There's a desire to be mature. I'm not going to stay an immature, uh, irresponsible child. I'm going to be mature. What else? This, this kind of builds on the diversity of gifts. Each of us is to take our place in God's plan. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt. Yep. Um, I may be getting ahead, the course ahead of the, behind the card maybe or something, but the rest of the chapter really is what all that's pointing to. If we, if we want to know 
what this church thing and what this Christian thing is, he outlines the whole rest of the chapter. Okay. And, and so you, you can't take one part of this book without looking at the rest of it because it's important. So what, what do you see then, uh, Bill, in the, in the remaining part of the chapter about what he's building toward um, in, in finding God through church? Well, when we say that we should do, that we should love everybody, that's, a, that's a one broad kind of a thing. But he's really outlining a whole lot of very specific acts and um, traits and behaviors that um, I, I may go out and if you have a need, I may give you something, but that shouldn't be the only thing that I do or should be known for. I'm sure, I'm sure Barnabas did more than just give money. Right. He encouraged people and he did a whole lot of other things. So it's a, it's a life changing thing rather than just a single behavior. In fact, much of what he talks about in the remaining part of the book, not just uh, chapter four, but the remaining part of the book has to do with uh, verse 19, um, a morality that has uh, a purity to it and uh, is not greedy because he's contrasting those who are walking in darkness to those who walk in light with Christ. He goes on to talk about anger. He talks about the way you use your tongue and unwholesome talk, um, where we're supposed to be building others up rather than using unwholesome talk. Uh, he goes in verse 31, some things about bitterness and rage and brawling and slander and malice. So as Bill has, is pointing out, he um, talks a great deal about what it looks like to see Jesus in our lives. As Peter pointed out, there's some things that we don't do, and there's some things that we do engage in as a part of that. Again, drawing from Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, the wise man takes Jesus' teachings and puts them into practice. Doesn't just memorize them, just, doesn't just discuss them. Puts those things into practice. So this brings us to the last question. Church is us. If you get tired of church, you're getting tired of you, all right? Uh, church is us. Church is not an organization centered around a building. It's not a social club only for perfect people. It's not a Bible society that gathers regularly for readings. Scripture uses words like family, fold, and followers to describe church. In your own words, what is church and how do people see God through us? That's the big question tonight, and I'm wanting to see how, how we have formulated that uh, as we've talked tonight. Dale? Yes. One thing that always comes to my mind is the love, the, the care that you have for your brothers and sisters, and the way you show it by helping whatever needs to be done. Uh, I've done short time at green line i've done a lot of different things and it, it's great to be able to help out when you can all right so as part of a family there is a helpful spirit that goes with being a uh with being church so what is church uh dale yeah it's it's needing one another too. It's part of that family and the scripture we just read of all the different gifts. We need to emphasize to people that we don't have all the bases covered. We need you. We need your gift. We need you to, to help us. And uh, 
I think growing up in an area where the church wasn't very strong, we depended on one another. We were against the world. And so we were, we needed one another uh, to have meals with and to, to show up on Sunday morning because we depended on each other for that encouragement. All right, so in places where you, and, and I can identify with this, where the church is not strong or numerous, that sense of need is, is much more profound. Yeah. What is church? We, we are church. What, what does that mean? And how do people see God through us? I think for me, it's that everything I do, I do for the, to glorify God. So my motivation, my, my goal, my purpose is to glorify God through my life in whatever I do. Yeah. And, by, and by being godly, I am then pointing people to God by the way I behave every day, by the way I treat people, by what I say and do. And, and this sometimes is in the most common and ordinary things of life. You know, you, you, you go pick up your grandchild from school. Can you glorify God through that? Sure you can. You uh, have to make a phone call to somebody who um, you're, who's on your call list at, at your work. Is that something you can glorify God through? Absolutely. In everything we do, we can glorify God. I think we have to, what we do in our homes needs to be the same as when we walk out the door. All right, so a consistency and authenticity yes. that yes. matches. We're, we're, we're not, again, not one way one place and another way another place is an important part of that. I think we're all family. Uh, the church is a family and God is the head of the family and that we want to please him together. All right, so being, being a family and living as a family under the headship of, of our Father. Uh -huh. Others? Dale, I'm a uh, big Fred Rogers fan. And, and both that I'm seeing in my bathroom and in my classroom. And it says, I believe that appreciation is a holy thing, that when we look for what's best in a person we happen to be with at that moment, we're doing what God does all the time. So in loving and appreciating our neighbor, we are participating in something sacred. So for me, um, I feel that church is being in the moment with the person that you're with at that moment and meeting them where they are, because that's what a lot of people did with me. They met me where I am, where I was, and now I love church. And so I'm trying to um, send that message to the people that I come in contact with. You, you didn't encounter a bunch of people who thought they were perfect. You encountered people who cared about you and and again, to use your words, met you where you are, which you, where you were in order to help you be where God wants you to be. Absolutely, because there's many people who, I think you said it before, I'm going to paraphrase, um, they feel intimidated by some of the people at church. I know that I have relatives who feel that um, they didn't want to go to church because they were sm the the people at church were smarter than them, and uh, more perfect, and so by bringing on meeting me where I was at, and by the people and, that I encountered, they I was the only person in the room, and that made me feel less intimidated. Um, and so that's the message that I was giving to some of my family members. Does that make sense? Yes. 
In fact, as you say that, here's the thought that occurred to me. We live in a college town in Lubbock, okay? There is the LCU right next door. There's Texas Tech down the street. Uh, there's a branch of South Plains that meets here, and I think there are even some even, even smaller uh, colleges in town. But we also have some uneducated people in town. Uh, people who have dropped out of school, people who have, um, um, again, who aren't educated. How do you, how do you, how do you reach a person with a PhD and also the person who is uh, just dropped out of school at eighth grade? Well, what Brenda's talking about that I think is, is, is very meaningful is you meet people where they are. And part of meeting people where they are is you asking questions about them and their lives and showing a genuine concern uh, for them. And uh, from there, introducing them to the God who loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them. That will help people see God. Any closing thoughts? Uh, go out and be church. Uh, don't, even though we're not gathering as church on a regular basis like uh, we've been accustomed to, uh, we still have a, an opportunity, so I encourage you, go out to church this week. Um, hope to see you on Sunday. Everybody take good care and good night. Love you.